Here we are. We are back to Mr. Tuckett, and we are. Oops. And we are at chapter seventeen. Chapter seventeen. The week of idle resting that Mr. Grimes had promised Francis never took place, but it wasn't the mountain man's fault. What happened to ruin the week was the sudden arrival of more company. But this time, the company didn't consist of friends of Jason Grimes. They arrived on the third day after all the pelts had been hung to dry. Contrary to what he had thought, Francis didn't sleep even for a day. After ten hours of solid snoring, he was up gathering wood, and by the second day, he was practically bored stiff. Don't fret on so much, Mr. Tuckett. Mr. Tuckett, the trapper said when Francis began grumbling. A man would think you wanted to go back to work. Rest up a mite. There'll be plenty to do. Francis snorted. I wouldn't even mind some more trapping. It's better than just sitting around getting soft. Ah, Mr. Tuckett, relax. Trap more beaver and you'd just have to sit around for another week. Things, these things take time. So Francis had dreamed up things to do. He made bullets when he already had enough to stand off a small army. He took to riding around the meadow along the stream, not going anywhere in particular, just riding. And he was riding on the morning of the third day out along the stream, just angling across it, not paying much attention to what he was doing when something whistled past his cheek, brushing him lightly, almost like a fly. He reached his hand up absently, and at that instant, the horse stepped on a rock and stumbled. The sudden movement saved Francis's life. The second arrow, which would have hit him squarely in the middle of the chest, word passed and buried itself in the muck of a beaver dam ten yards upstream. Hee-haw! Francis screamed, and at that same second fired his rifle in the air. He had two purposes in mind for shooting the rifle. First, it would warn Mr. Grimes. Second, it would get the mare running. And run she did. Like a little bomb going off beneath Francis, she was out of the stream and at a full gallop in the space of one breath while he clung to her back like a flea. She ran straight ahead, and luckily she happened to be pointing toward the camp. But unluckily, she was also pointed toward the Indians who were hidden in the brush along the stream between Francis and the camp. And she took him straight through the middle of them. Francis hadn't seen the Indians, and suddenly he was ten feet away from all five of them. They were five crows painted for war, ready and wanting one thing, to make Francis look like a porcupine. Arrows whistled by him, and Francis felt as though the world had suddenly gone crazy. Painted faces popped up in front of him, screeched loose a, fire, a feathered missile, and disappeared. Somebody fired a gun, right by his face and it deafened him. He felt a hand grab at his leg and he managed to shake it off. Another hand came up, he clubbed it down with his empty rifle and he was free. He was out of the ring of faces and arrows flying along with the mare. He looked back, he had, not, he had seen no horses, but he knew that the Indians wouldn't be too far from their mounts. It was nearly two miles to camp, not long miles, or two long miles. His horse was well fed and with any kind of lead, he could probably beat them. He studied the ground ahead. It was smooth, grassy, idle for, ideal for running. He looked back again and saw that two Indians were mounted and starting after him. As he watched, three others burst out of the stand of willows near where they jumped, where they jumped Francis. It would be a chase. Francis studied his lead a hundred yards, no more, and he was holding an empty rifle. I have to beat them, he thought. He had a good mount in his Indian pony, but the crows were also riding Indian ponies. It stood to reason that out of five ponies, at least one would be as fast or faster than his, and he couldn't expect miracles all the time. Sure enough, one of the ponies was as fast as his little mare, but two others were faster, and they gained rapidly. Before he'd covered half a mile, they had cut his hundred-yard lead in half. Francis leaned forward. Run! If I ever needed speed, I need it now. She was full out already. She put her ears back and stretched an inch or two, but it didn't help much. Another half mile, he thought, watching the two Indians gaining on him, and they'll be alongside of me. Then what? Forty yards now, and one of the Indians raised his bow and loosed an arrow. Francis, looking back, saw the arrow rise in the slow arc and fall toward him. He felt his stomach tighten as his eyes followed his course. It fell short by ten yards or so. The Indian fitted another arrow to the bow and aimed. His, he's getting the range, Francis thought. Only 30 yards separated them now. Francis nudged his pony just as the Indian shot his second arrow. The mare veered to the left, till still at a dead run, and the arrow missed. 20 yards now. They can't miss again, he thought. Not at this range. Only 15 yards, and now two Indians raise their bows. 
No, Francis cried, you can't. And then he heard it. Far off, a noise like the sound of a muted thunder. A second later, he heard something whisper over his head, and the lead, the lead Indian fell from his horse. The second Indian veered aside, releasing his arrow at the same time, but missing Francis. The Hawkins, the great Hawkins of Jason Grimes, had done it again. Francis eased up a bit and looked for the mountain man. It was still almost a quarter of a mile to camp, an impossible range, an impossible shot. Now Francis saw him, a speck that was leaning against a tree by the camp. At this range, it was impossible to tell what the mountain man was doing, but in a moment, Francis knew. A cloud of smoke jumped out in front of him, and the sound of a shot followed. Francis whirled to watch the Indians, one of the ponies somersaulted, throwing his rider heavily. That still left three, and those three stopped, dismounted, and hid behind the available cover. Francis dropped down to a canter. It was safe now, and the mare was blowing pretty hard. Even so, it wasn't but a few minutes before he dismounted at the camp. Mr. Grimes was smiling. I do, de I do declare, Mr. Tuckett, you sure pick some mighty funny people to be horse racing with. If you were all that hard up for something to do, I might have raced you myself. You didn't have to go and find a bunch of crows. Well, you know how it is, Francis answered, returning the smile, though he was shaking inside and felt a little sick to his stomach. I was getting pretty bored just sitting around all the time. A fellow needs some actions now and then. Used to be that way myself before I lost my arm. Still, I wish you'd come and ask, for, ask me before you do those things. He pointed to the Indians in the field. One of them had mounted and was heading away at a run. The mountain man shrugged. No sense doing any more fancy shooting. One of them would be a bound to get away. Where is he going, Francis asked. For help, Mr. Tuckett, and I expect not too far, the way he's riding. Well, you said you wanted something to do, some action. Unless I miss my guess, before long, you're going to get all the action you ever wanted. Unless. Unless what? Unless we run, Mr. Tuckett, and stay ahead. But we can't run, Francis said. There are two of them left watching us. They'd know right where we went. I swear, Mr. Tuckett, you're getting smarter every day. So it appears that what we've got to do is get rid of those two Indians in the field. We? Sure. Were you figured on doing it all by yourself? Francis looked out across the meadow. Two ponies stood grazing almost a mile away, but the Indians weren't in sight. They could be anywhere, everywhere. How do we do it? Simple, Mr. Tuckett. We just walk out there until they shoot at us, then we shoot back. <laughs> Francis suddenly remembered that his rifle was empty. He reloaded it quickly. All right, Mr. Tuckett, let's go. We don't have all day. The mountain man started walking out across the meadow. His rifle draped across, casually across his shoulder. He looked for all the world as though he were just going for a morning stroll or perhaps to hunt rabbits, except these rabbits. Francis thought, hurrying to catch up, aren't like normal rabbits. These rabbits shoot back. Oh, gotta read the next chapter. Francis would never forget that morning walk. He was afraid, and as they walked closer to where they, he thought the two Indians were, he became more and more afraid. His forehead ran with sweat, and it was all he could do to keep from stopping or turning or yelling, but he didn't. He couldn't, because a mountain man was really depending on him. You take the one on the right when they jump us, Mr. Tuckett, Mr. Grimes said in his usual casual voice as they walked. I'll do my best on the, on the left one. So Francis couldn't afford to let fear dominate his actions. If he froze up or ran, it would mean it could mean the death of Mr. Grimes. If he missed or shot a second time, a second late, Mr. Grimes would be gone. He tried to calm down so he could watch the grass for, mo for movement or see any signs in the soft dirt, but his fear was too real. And then Mr. Grimes stopped, held up his hand, and said, "Mind now, Mr. Tuckett. They're close. I can feel them." Francis couldn't feel anything. All he could think was that somehow, some way, they had walked past the Indians and he would, would get an arrow in his back any second. Now, that's all he heard. That shot from Mr. Grimes. From then on, everything was automatic. In front of them, not 10 feet away, two painted faces and bronze chests rose. Two arrows were pulled back on taut strings. Two Indian throats let out a roaring sound. Francis fired without aiming. He just pointed his rifle in the general direction of the Indian on his right side and pulled the trigger. Then he turned and ran. He ran until he stumbled and fell, and then he lay on the ground and was sick, sick from fear, sick from having fired his rifle at a man, no matter the man's intent. Mr. Grimes came up to him a moment later. Did, did, did I, did you shoot him? Francis nodded. Yes, Mr. Tucker, and a fair shot it was, too. It kept him occupied long enough for me to finish him. You mean I didn't kill him? Nope. 
He only winged him, creased him along the head, but it was enough to give him something else to think about till I could get in close. Francis sat up. The grass was still cool, but the sun felt good. Better, far better than it had a few minutes before. We did it, eh, Mr. Grimes? Noah, Mr. Tuckett? That isn't quite true. We did part of it. We still have to get out of this place before that brave comes back, and the longer you sit there, the more likely it is to some of the more likely it is some brave's going to wind up with your hair for a dance tonight. Aren't you forgetting something? Francis asked. One of those Indians was thrown by his pony, and that Indian is still around. He'll follow us. Not without a horse, he won't, and we're going to have their horses under beaver pelts. Now, quit your jawing. At a fast trot, the mountain man was heading back toward the camp. Francis followed him. Once there, Mr. Grimes started on the beaver pelts, which were still damp, but dry enough to lash into bundles and to be tied across the horses. He told Francis to mount up and go after the Indian ponies. It, only t it took only a few minutes. His mare still smelled all right to the Indian ponies, so they didn't shy away when he approached. But he had one bad moment after he had gathered up the four pony ponies. While he was walking them back to camp, he rode past the Indian who had been thrown. He was sitting on the ground, and if eyes could kill, Francis would have been dead. The Indian was trying to draw his bow, but Francis could see that an injured shoulder wouldn't allow this action. In addition, one of his legs was twisted under him. Francis rode past quietly. Mr. Grimes had been working like a fiend. All the pelts were lashed into bundles of 25 stacked and waiting. The mules had been cut loose and scared off. Why don't we use the mules, Francis asked. Too slow, came the quick answer, and they'd need grain to move faster. Indian ponies can do it on grass, and we're going to be needing some speed. That was the last word spoken for over an hour. Working hard, Mr. Grimes and Francis tied the pelts and bundles across the ponies. They were a bit skittish at first, smelling the almost green hides, but Mr. Grimes kept them tied close to trees until their eyes quit rolling and they stopped blowing. Then he and Francis mounted their horses and rode out. It had been almost two hours since the brave had gone for help. If the rest of the tribe were within 15 miles of the camp, the brave mate and more warriors could be back any second. Francis and Mr. Grimes rode hard, holding the horses at a steady lope. The Indian ponies kept up easily, and since the temperature had dropped considerably, it was cool enough to allow a decent run without heating the horses too much. South, down the canyon, in the direction that they were heading, clouds were building into a gray wall that indicated snow or rain. Twenty minutes later, back at the cabin, ten crow braves dismounted and briefly studied the campsite and surrounding areas. They found many things by filling the manure, Left by the horses and finding it still warm, they knew that Mr. Grimes and Francis had only a, only a short lead. By noting all the beaver traps left behind, they suspected that the two were running in fear. The leader of the party, an old man, not too old to ride, but old enough to have wisdom, smiled at two of the younger men who were ready to ride their ponies into the ground to catch Mr. Grimes and Francis. Let us stay here for a time and help Laughing Pony fix his shoulder and leg. Then we will go. We will still have them before daybreak tomorrow. The man, the young men shook their heads and grumbled, but did as they had been told. Wow, that was chapter 17 and 18. Back for more next time. Bye.